So rejection rates in the early 1980s and 1990s was as high as 30%. Today, our rejection rates are in the single digits, are close to like 5-7% at the most. So significant improvement is because of how we were able to match donors and recipients. Welcome to the Innovatively Speaking podcast, a podcast brought to you by the Medical University of South Carolina. In each episode, we dive into the origins of the next big things, the who, the why, the how. We explore ideas that are changing what's possible here at the Medical University of South Carolina, and in some cases, all across the world. I'm Kevin Smith in the MUSC podcast studio with my co-host, the Chief Innovation Officer here at MUSC, Dr. Jesse Goodwin. Good morning. Good morning, Kevin. Today's guest is the head of the MUSC Department of Transplantation, Dr. Prab Baliga. We're going to be talking about the importance of transplantation and how this field has evolved. Set the stage for us, Jesse. So I met Baliga, I think when he joined MUSC as the department chair, right around the same time that I started, I think. We'll have to figure out exactly when we both came. Um, But it's been really exciting to watch what he's done with his department. He is a big supporter of um, not just really great advancements in terms of innovative clinical care, but um, has grown his research base within his department and also started a lot of new programs that support innovation, particularly for students and trainees. And so so it's been really great to have a collaborator um, and a colleague who believes in fostering it amongst his own group as well. So I'm, in, I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Fascinating subject matter. Let's, let's dive right in. Well, Dr. Baliga, welcome to the MUSC Innovatively Speaking podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. All right, let's, uh, let's start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your history in the transplant field how you got interested in that, and how that led you to where you are today. Sure. A little bit of background. Uh, You know, kidney transplantation was first started in 1954 by Joseph Murray, who won the Nobel Prize. And uh, really, the immunosuppressive medications were pretty um, uh, sporadic and not very strong, and success rates were very low, probably around 30 to 35% in that range at one-year survival. In 1984, a new drug was discovered called cyclosporin, and that radically changed the transplant world. Uh, it overnight increased transplant success rates from um, double them, 30-35 to 70 percent. Overnight, overnight, just right, right yeah. away. Wow. Correct. A phenomenal success, and more importantly, that opened the doors for extra renal organs, liver intestines, hearts, lungs, uh, and all the extra renal organs then became more successful. So everything, what people would suggest like in its infancy or rather than like in the neonatal ICU of of transplant where um, it had been kind of stagnated for a long period of time, it kind of exploded. And so uh, everything which I was reading during my training in the 1980s was on liver transplantation and it kind of... uh, clearly fascinated me that somebody could take a patient who, I apologize for an analogy, who looked like a watermelon because a liver patient uh, accumulates a lot of fluid. They turn yellow and jaundiced and uh, they get confused. Taking a patient like that and doing a massive surgery of removing their entire liver and then uh, immunosuppressing their, uh, so suppressing their immune system that can fight rejection, but also decreases the ability to fight infection. But end of the day, you have a 70, 75% success rate. This is in the 1980s. That really fascinated me, and that's where I went into the field of transplantation. Uh, and then moving forward, uh, fast forward, in, uh, I was contacted by uh, the medical university and I was at the uh, University of Michigan, because it was a very, very odd situation in South Carolina. <laughs> uh, South Carolina Medicaid had a contract with the University of Nebraska to send children for liver transplantation to Nebraska. 
That's <laughs> so, interesting. I had no idea. Yeah. So I was brought in to start a pediatric liver transplant program here in 1992. So that's the genesis of how I joined the university. I didn't realize, um, so I think we met after you became department chair. So can you talk a little bit about your journey from joining as a faculty member and starting that pediatric program to sure. when you uh, stepped into the role as, as the department chair for surgery? Yeah, so that's a pretty long journey from uh, 92 to 2015. And uh, during that period of time, I'd say fortunately, transplant continued to grow in leaps and bounds. Uh, from an innovation standpoint, interestingly, transplant was had very little innovation. We just uh, opened a transplant immunobiology lab, and for a short period of time, for a few years, uh, and very few people know this. I was a, a basic scientist in my previous life, <laughs> doing T cell co-receptor blockade work, and I was young and naive, and I felt I could break that uh, egg uh, in terms of what's called transplant tolerance, where you could take uh, patients and uh, create models that they no longer needed lifelong immunosuppression. Un unfortunately, you know, I failed, and I think the field <laughs> still requires <laughs> patients to re uh, take anti-rejection medications for a long period of time. Uh, and the second part, which we initiated in transplant at that point of time, is uh, clinical trials. Clinical trials of a variety of new medications, and we were the leaders in the country on several new anti-rejection medications, which have now come out, in, um, such as uh, what's called IL-2 receptors, a type of uh, a receptor blockade, which is still utilized today. We were one of the uh, early um, and one of the largest recruiters for that clinical trial. We also were the largest recruiters for a clinical trial called a different class of, of uh, anti-rejection medications, which blocks a completely different pathway called mTOR, uh, and it's a drug called sirolimus. Uh, so, so we were the lead, became the leaders in in clinical trials of several. Uh, newer medications were then introduced to transplantation. Well, I was just going to say, let's back up a second for, for lay people like myself. Um, let's let's, let's kind of define what's going on with transplantation. Before we got started, we were talking a little bit about that most people don't realize that when you have a transplant, you'll, you'll spend the, a good part of the rest of your life taking the, these medicines to, to keep your body from rejecting the, the transplanted organ. Uh, we, we were discussing that it seems like most people think it's just you just find a good match and then you transplant and you're good, but that's not the case. Absolutely. So we know, you know the um, extent that we focus on matching or the importance of matching has decreased over time. So today we just mainly look at uh, uh, typing, you know, blood types, and uh, we kind of expand. So, for example, for a living donor transplants today, uh, th more than a third of the living donor transplants that we perform are in unrelated patients. So spousal, friends, anybody in your social circle, altruistic donation, because the anti-rejection medication profile has improved so much and our success rates are so high. So in our, I'll just pick on our kidney transplant program, we have a 98% patient survival at the end of the year and a kidney graft survival of 96% at the end of one year. So these are phenomenal outcomes and not really related to any kind of uh, you know matching. So the focus on matching has com completely decreased. So I tell my patients, so it's a common misconception of, and unfortunately even today we lose some graphs because uh, patients stop taking the medications, uh, particularly the teenage group who always feel the invincible. Uh, so, in the, so I tell my patients uh, you know, uh, to think about it like a car that irrespective of how old the car is, unless it's got gas in it, it's going to die in the middle of the highway. So they got to take their <laughs> their gas, <laughs> right, their anti-rejection yeah. medicines uh, every day. And uh, most patients relate to that and hopefully uh, keeps them, uh, keep these organs going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess one of the great things about the f having so many drugs and the anti-rejection sort of um, success rate um, that can be related to that is that it's I would imagine it opens up the world for donors because to find a direct match or to find a family member who is able and willing, you know, would kind of really limit your organ pool. Um, and so I imagine that as, 
you know, as you've had to or been able to decrease the emphasis on matching, you've been able to increase the number of organs that that you've transplanted. Is that correct? That is true, but still, unfortunately, tremendously inadequate. Uh, If you look at the overall picture of this country, uh, about 100,000 patients waiting for a transplant, and we perform about 20,000 transplants a year for kidneys. Uh, And if you take South Carolina, strictly looking at uh, kidney transplantation, about 10,000 patients on dialysis, and uh, overall South Carolina performs about 500 kidney transplants. So the gap in terms of the need of the population and the uh, number of transplants we are able to perform is still very large, and unfortunately, there's still a significant uh, death on the waiting list. Uh, But even again there, there's a lot of education which needs to get done because patients feel that they can live on dialysis for a long period of time. They do not realize the impact of a kidney transplant in uh, prolonging the lifespan and just not uh, a substitute for dialysis. What do you think some of the biggest barriers are, you know, we can talk nationally or just here in South Carolina on increasing that, that organ pool? Uh, particularly for something like like kidney where you could do it as a living donor? So I think, you know, the two answers to that question, I think one is clearly focusing on an immediate need of, and I think that the biggest uh, impact would be education and uh, getting folks to understand the importance and signing a, a donor card and uh, ensuring donor education. So anyone who's a potential donor that we can utilize those organs would be tremendous. But I think the long run, I think uh, from an innovation standpoint, we clearly have to go into uh, either xenografts or uh, bioengineering uh, pathways to create our own organs or have a larger donor pool, which is uh, easily available because even today, I would say the logistics of uh, uh, performing a transplant uh, is uh, very complicated where we get kidneys from all over the country, they fly fly by commercial flights, it's a complicated algorithm of how kidneys are allocated. Uh, So a lot of things behind the scenes that uh, folks on the, uh, or many uh, lay people may not uh, relate to it, but there's a tremendous amount of complexity of trying to fit 100,000 into the 20,000 funnel into the funnel to see who will have the maximum uh, benefit or who's been waiting the longest and all these uh, competing parameters uh, are, we don't have a good answer today. That's really interesting. So I think you, you pointed to two or three ways that, you know, going forward as we look at like what's next in the field that we might be able to increase the number of organ transplants that we're doing. And um, I think the first one that you mentioned was xenografts and the use of those. So can you describe for the listeners like what is a xenograft and what are our current challenges with using them and sort of where you see the field going with that particular type of organ? Yes, yeah, so, so xenografts are uh, taking organs from a different species, and the one which is extremely popular or the pathway that uh, the transplant field is going in is in porcine or pig uh, organs. Uh, the challenge with pig organs is because there are different species that could be rejected immediately. It's called, uh, the terminology is called hyperacute rejection, that if you just place a, a pig kidney into a human uh, within a matter of a uh, couple of few minutes, uh, the kidney will be lost uh, because of a very severe type of rejection. So now they've genetically engineered some of these organs, so they do not reject. And uh, so there's been a proof of concept, a uh, couple of transplants being performed at uh, in New York. And so we're all waiting to see the continued success. In Baltimore, there was a, a heart transplant performed from a, again from a pig. Uh, some of the concerns are just not from a rejection standpoint, but uh, animals contain different types of viruses, as we've seen with COVID. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of anxiety that we do not uh, transmit any infection along with the organ. It's called zoonosis. Uh, so you're very nervous about, in the process of helping somebody, you could you know, potentially create a life-threatening situation. And the second component is also the function of the graft. Uh, the function of a kidney in a in a pig, or you know, or is very would be very different. So I think the organ which is most applicable uh, for uh, you know supporting humans would probably be the heart, uh, and particularly I would say the most critical need is in uh, pediatric hearts, 
but it's very difficult to get a small size heart uh, for a, uh, an infant or, uh, or a small child. Uh, so I think in that group, uh, it can have a, a huge impact and save many lives. So when we think about um, some of the challenges with the sort of operational process, um, Beluga, with, you know, identifying and, and how to make sure that the right recipient on that really big list um, gets the right um, organ and, and how do you sort of prioritize and decide, make those decisions. Um, can you talk about some of the advancements in that field and, and what's being done there to sort of ensure equity and sort of do a better job with, you know, taking that limited pool and making sure that the, the most deserving are getting it? Yeah, thank you very much for asking that question. And that's uh, you know, very important and what's happened in the background from an immunological standpoint of how to match donors and recipients from an immunological standpoint. Uh, that's gone through so much of, and that's a major impact that has prevented rejection. So rejection rates in the uh, early 1980s and 1990s was as high as 30%. Today, our rejection rates are in the single digits, are close to like 5 7% at the most. So significant improvements is because of how we were able to match donors and recipients. Uh, so it, we talked briefly in like in xenografts of hyperacute rejection or rejecting in a few minutes. You prevent that by what's calling a cross match. Uh, and that's done in the background. Before we call a patient in for a kidney or pancreas or any of the, uh, and mainly for heart, lungs, et cetera, if they have what we call antibodies in their system. We want to, and these are not blood tap antibodies. These are very specific, which are called HLA antibodies. We, cre- uh, we had to perform a physical cross match uh, by mixing the cells with the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, mixing the donor cells with the patient's serum and looking at that reaction under a microscope or under flow cytometry was something physically which needed to get done. But with progress that we've made uh, and understanding population kind of genetics, uh, the entire field has shifted to a virtual platform so in the vast majority, almost I would say 99% of our donors today, we do not perform a physical cross match. We just go by a virtual cross match. And that was one of the areas, again, that MUSC was a leader uh, in creating these virtual cross matches. So, and the two important areas, so number one, that organs are not discarded for, uh, because you come in here and the, uh, and the patient has a positive cross match and the kidneys already got X number of hours. Uh, and so you cannot utilize the kidneys. So that we kind of prevent that from happening and to uh, improve uh, significantly our rejection rates and the graft survival. So that was one of the area that MUSC was a, a leader in virtual cross matching. It's really fascinating. And, and it, would strike me that you know it would help increase the the reach of um, where you're able to get your organs from when you're procuring, right? Because if you have to bring it on to your point and then do a physical match only to find out that it doesn't work, now, you know, it, it would strike me that you're sort of limited to a very defined geographical area. Exactly. And if you so, can do it virtually. So today it's completely shifted that uh, out in, um, about I would say less than ten years ago. 80% of our kidneys used to come from South Carolina. Today, I would say probably about 25% of my kidneys come from South Carolina. It's because of changes in the allocation system, 75% of my kidneys come from uh, outside the state. And so ensuring that we are able to get, get to them quickly and safely and transport them quickly uh, has, uh, creates more pressure on the transplant team. So virtual cross match has been a, a godsend for, I for can our group. Imagine. <laughs> I'm sure. It, I, I'm guessing it would save obviously on time, absolutely, but also in discomfort. I would think that making some of these transplants happen with a lot of question marks could be difficult for everybody involved. Uh, absolutely, no question about it. it. Gives a surgeon a lot more comfort. Yeah, and uh, hopefully we relay that to the patient too in terms of a comfort level and their anxiety for rejection uh, is significantly decreased. Figured it out before the organ even gets in the body. Yeah, so, and again, it's, you know, the treatment for rejection takes a big toll on their bodies, where you're giving massive doses of steroids, for example, or in, in, uh, the increasing in, you know, anti-rejection medications 
then impact uh, opportunistic uh, infections like viruses and uh, different uh, types of infections that we do not normally see in healthy human beings. Uh, so those infection rates have also significantly decreased and our overall uh, anti-rejection dosage has significantly decreased because we're able to create these virtual platforms and ensure uh, you know, maximal and optimal outcomes. So I think one of the other avenues for that you mentioned, Beliga, for potentially increasing the number of, of donors um, would be by engineering uh, tissues. And I know here at MUSC we have a whole department of regenerative medicine looking at doing that, but can you describe sort of what that looks like, um, you know, present state and then where potentially in the future we could be able to go with it? Yeah, it's still in its infancy and I think there are several pathways that you can take. Uh, one pathway is, uh, which uh, I think has more immediate promise, is better preservation of organs and uh, understanding the tissue metabolism. So recently there's been significant improvements in organ preservation. So, for example, uh, when you're even on patients whose hearts have stopped, we're able to utilize the heart and lungs and other organs, which is uh, by placing them on a special pump. Uh, so that's now commercially and FDA approved and has now come to clinical practice. And that's a huge impact in terms of increasing the number of organs that we can utilize. Um, the second component would be, at, again, at the cellular level, that you can use uh, islets for pancreas or liver cells for uh, you know, for patients who need uh, livers or even uh, up, uh, kidneys which are scarred, can you can regenerate, or the ones which are, you know, uh, which is more further along is in hearts. We have uh, some scarring and you can inject heart cells and regenerate. So that's one pathway instead of having uh, entirely whole organs. Let's talk about the timeline a little bit. You were saying 1984 is when a big pivot point with these new drugs. And now... What's your main area of innovation? I feel like with all these different types of organs, there's different challenges for each one. I think there are a kind of couple of different, you know, I think the opportunities, number one, are endless. Yeah. Um, so I think the immediate needs, for example, if we talked about uh, like of tolerance of not, uh, you know, taking a, a lifelong anti-rejection medication, there's some very interesting clinical trials coming uh, in terms of getting bone marrow along with your kidney and preventing lifelong immunosuppression by simultaneous bone marrow and kidney transplants in the living donor situation. That's one uh, which is coming up and seems very promising. Uh, blocking multiple receptors in the same concept um, that at, at the time that your body is exposed to this, what we call foreign antigens of the you know, donor, then you blockading them at what one stre- at one time point that again will create these pathways. So minimizing some of the complications of transplant is uh, one pathway. I think the biggest promise is, uh, as everybody talks about today, is what do you do with artificial intelligence? And the application of artificial intelligence in this complex area of transplant is simply, I think it's going to be, uh, uh, have a huge impact and an early impact probably within the next five, 10 years and impacting every single aspect of transplant. Uh, for MUSC, I think we're very fortunate. We recruited a surgeon uh, more recently who's leading our artificial intelligence work, uh, Armand Kilic, and he's won uh, a few grants in that area. And it ranges from uh, healthcare delivery aspects and how do we maximize organ distribution, et cetera. So on the other parts, which we just talked about in terms of regenerative medicine and xenos, is AI being applied to creating what are these proteins and creating these protein structures that can uh, overcome some of the barriers of Xeno or some of the barriers of uh, regenerative medicine. I think the, it will accelerate the progress in those fields uh, um, by several years or several decades with the applications of AI. It's exciting. It is really exciting. I think the MUSC or the Department of Surgery investment is uh, in in a couple of different areas. Uh, we we're, we're trying to create our own um, within the department a nucleus for uh, accelerating AI research. Uh, so we have uh, we've 
fortunate to have gotten a donation and uh, f- from a grateful patient and created the Schiller Innovation Center, which uh, where uh, AI, human-centered design, clinical outcomes research is in one area right in the center of the department that then uh, facilitates and allows us to ask these questions. And uh, we've hired a, a few machine learning PhD scientists and master scientists to then take our ideas and accelerate it. So we're hoping that um, along with many of the other uh, universities across the country that we will be on the cutting edge of the future of uh, AI and uh, just not in transplantation, but across the entire surgical sciences. Uh, so that's a major focus for us. Uh, and then another major focus for us is a, a very different, uh, you know, line of focus is in, ensuring that we uh, create equity and everybody benefits from it. And I think that's an area in South Carolina that we need to particularly pay attention to. Uh, and again, in my field of kidney transplantation, all the field, uh, I'm sorry, in the population is has 28% blacks almost 65% of the dialysis population is black. So the disparity in uh, of kidney failure in that population is so high. So as we approach these innovations, we also have to ensure uh, the equity and ensure that the entire population is benefiting from, these, uh, from the progress that we make. So today, the number one reason of our etiology for renal failure is diabetes. So uh, I have to end with saying that uh, we just can't solve everything with innovation. A large component of this has to be preventive medicine and preventing the progress of uh, the impact of diabetes, hypertension, and obesity is uh, extremely critical to our population. For the longest time, we were the only transplant program in South Carolina. So we were first for all, all organs here in South Carolina. I think the uh, unique organ that we transplanted for a while, which we were the first in the Southeast, was uh, intestinal transplants. Um, So children who have lost uh, their their small intestines or they could not absorb food um, can be, you know, uh, uh, can receive a small bowel transplant. So we were the first in the Southeast to perform that. I actually had no idea that that was a transplanted organ. So I just, not only did I not know that we were the first to do it, I had no idea that that was actually one of the organs on the list that could be transplanted. That's cool. The surgical technique for each of them has significantly changed. Uh, You know, uh, for, uh, you know, speaking a little bit about liver transplant, which we talked about earlier, the surgical technique uh, involved putting them on bypass uh, because you had to clamp uh, just below your heart and above your kidneys to cut the old liver out. And so we used to place patients on a on a bypass by making a uh, an incision in their groin and taking the blood out from below and making another incision in their armpit and circulating the blood and giving it back in the armpit. So now I'd say we haven't done a, a liver on bypass probably for the last decade. Uh, we've also understood uh, the coagulation pathways better. So the blood transfusion requirement. So when I started. Uh, a liver transplant patient would receive about maybe 25 units of blood. Today, probably less than five in most cases, maybe, you know, three to five would be the the mean. So uh, the duration of surgery used to be about uh, a good eight, 10 hours. Uh, to, so today, probably about four or five hours because the improvements in anesthetic, uh, anesthesia management, intra-op management. Uh, so several areas have improved so much uh, so, so I feel like an old dinosaur <laughs> if I tell them this is how we perform liver transplant in the 1980s and 90s. I mean, it was, it was cutting edge for the time, right? Yeah, so it's really exciting. The patients come out, so I'd say probably a good third of the patients um, are what we call extubated or taken off the breathing machine in the operating room. Uh, whereas in the old days, it would be on the breathing machine for a couple of days. Uh, you know, so lo- lots and lots of uh, uh, improvements uh, at every level. Uh, and it's really exciting to see and looking forward to the big improvements of uh, you know uh, uh, organ uh, preservation and uh, availability of organs and 
uh, you know, further improvements in anti-rejection medications. Yeah, it feels like we've come so far in a relatively short amount of time and there's still like so much more exciting work ahead, right? We're kind of just on the cusp of what's next. Yeah, and all these improvements are because of innovation on your part in, in a lot of ways. And so we just want to say thank you so much for spending some time with us here at Innovatively Speaking today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you very much. You've been listening to the Innovatively Speaking podcast with the Medical University of South Carolina. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, leave a rating and review. To hear more innovative ideas and to share your own, subscribe to the show or visit us on our webpage, web.musc.edu slash innovation. And remember, don't hesitate to innovate.